Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala khatam al anbiya wa mursaleen nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa ba'd. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, before I begin, I want everybody, um, everybody to just to stand up. You've been listening for a long time. They say, say it's a hot day in Vancouver. Like everybody stand up and just sort of move around a little bit. And uh, you know, let the blood flow in your minds. Uh, you know, breathe. Okay, shukran. I just want everybody to be uh, awake. You know, sometimes these conferences are a little bit uh, uh, long, especially on hot days. Okay, alhamdulillah. I want to begin uh, by giving you a bushra, as some glad tidings about changes that are happening uh, in Canada itself. Far to the north, in the province called Nunavut, in the city of Iqaluit. You need to go back to your geography of Canada. Far in the north, by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are people who are embracing Islam now. They are from the Inuits. They are some of the original people uh, living here in the northern part of this hemisphere. And on a journey there last year, I found uh, some of the Inuit people, alhamdulillah, who embraced Islam, not because of marriage, but through conviction. In one case, the brother uh, made the intention to translate the Quran into his language, Inaktutak, which, is be which had been spoken by people in uh, the Americas over 10,000 years ago. So this is a breakthrough for us in terms of the indigenous people of the lands uh, embracing Islam and the opportunity now to reach the core of our society. But there's also a challenge. A sister embraced Islam from the Inuit from conviction, and she put on full hijab Islamic dress. And as she walked through the streets, she ran into some of her people and they looked at her and they had been watching television and the movies and getting the propaganda. And they said, oh, you people reached all the way up here. You people are this far up. And she turned to them and spoke to them in perfect inaktutak. And they were shocked to see somebody speaking this language, which is extremely difficult to learn, and which only few people are speaking now, but the person is fully committed uh, to Islam. But the challenge that we learn from this is that the people's perception of Islam, the duty of the Muslims now to reach out to society, to take the role that was given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has reached critical proportion now, and especially for the younger generation. This is a really important time in the history of the planet. In terms of our atmosphere, the scientists just recently have announced that we have reached a new time period in terms of our temperature and our future. Because now they have found that there are over 400 parts carbon dioxide per million in the atmosphere. What that means is we are coming into the hottest time periods in maybe two to three million years. They have not recorded anything like this. They cannot find any trace of carbon dioxide reaching this level. And so what is happening is a greenhouse, it is undisputed now. And we thought for a long time that we are living in Canada, we are free of this. We are in the big, beautiful country. And that happens in the third world, that happens in other places. But the flood in Calgary that they're talking about now, they're saying it is the biggest flood in living memory. This is how they're speaking about it. Just three weeks ago, we had an earthquake in Ontario that was 5.2 on the Richter scale. It's not the largest earthquake. However, it means the fault is active. And so what is happening is that people are preparing, or at least people are becoming more and more aware 
of major crises looming on the horizon, but yet the activities are not equaling the reality. And so it's a very critical point, especially for Muslims, because we are carrying the message, the last testament to humanity. We're carrying this message. And, and, and we are rising in numbers. Everywhere around the planet, you will see large numbers of Muslims. We have extremely wealthy people. We have universities. We have technology. But something needs to change in order for us to really reach our potential. Because with the great wealth, there is also extreme poverty. With the large armies of Islam that stand at bay, there are still situations that should not be happening. Syria should not be happening like this. In the past, our nation could solve the problem. So there's something on the inside, something that has to change in this generation. Qualities that we need to now resurrect amongst ourselves, to remind ourselves, and to inspire the younger generation, to pray to Allah Azza wa Jal, to give them the qualities to go forward. Because the great leadership which rose with the Ummah in the past, it did not come in a vacuum. Salah al-Din al-Ayubi rahimahullah, the great Salah al-Din who liberated Jerusalem, he did not come out of the sky. He was part of a movement. And you need to study Imaduddin Zengi, Nuruddin Zengi, Shirku, rahimahumullah, the great Kurdish Mujahideen leaders who set the pace for Salah al-Din. And Salah al-Din grew up in this madrasa, so to speak. He grew up in the shadow of people who were teaching him and guiding him and giving the example, and then he took his place in history. Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, who opened up Constantinople, rahimahullah, he did not come in a vacuum. His father was telling him from when he was very young, you will open up Constantinople. His teachers geared him for the mission. And so it is crucial now, uh, as the Ummah rises, that we rise with the right direction. Because rising alone is not enough. It's like somebody who's getting out, a giant getting out of sleep, and who's not sure, you just wake up and you're not sure to go to the right or the left, and it's not until you drink some water and turn on the light, then you get your balance. And so we are in need of that balance and to um, nurture within the younger generation, within our leaders, that understanding of the balance of Islam. The best examples for us to get uh, our inspiration are from the first generation. And the Prophet ﷺ told us very clearly, خير الناس, that the best generation, qarni thumma ladhina yalunahum, thumma ladhina yalunahum. The best generation, the best people is my generation, then the one that follows them, and then the one that follows them. And from amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, there are certain companions whose qualities match our crisis right now. We are in a leadership crisis. Every community that I go to, I've gone to 61 countries now, and sat with Muslims, researched their history, looked at what was happening, and in most cases, there's a leadership crisis. The people say, we need an imam. We have a beautiful Islamic center, but there's no imam. We have a beautiful masjid. There's no leadership. Our country is here. People are, are, are marching in the streets. They're saying, Ashab yurid is qatan nidam. The people want the system to come down. But what will replace the system? This is the question. And one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, whose, whose qualities are not known, the depth of his qualities are not known by many Muslims, he is inspiring us and, and his balance and his example is uh, for me one of the most clear 
examples of the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to that generation and to us itself. And this is uh, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu. Abu Ubaidah, whose name was actually uh, Amir ibn Abdullah ibn al-Jarrah, he was described as he was tall and thin and um, he was pleasant to look at, a sparsely uh, grown beard. He was a very courteous person and polite. And they described him as Kathir al Haya. He had a lot of modesty. To the point where you could even describe that as being shy. But shyness and modesty in Islam is not weakness. We tend to think of a shy person as a weak person. But a shy person in Islam, a modest person, is somebody who knows his limits. And so he was Kathir al Haya. He had a lot of modesty. But at the same time, he was described in dangerous situations as the sharp side of the sword. So he was polite and modest, but when danger came, when trouble came, he became uh, alert, serious, and severe. So he was strong in fighting evil, but yet he was a very humble person, easy to get along with and polite. That's the kind of quality that we need today. Today, people are on extremes. Either the per person has some strength and then everybody's afraid of them. Nobody can talk to them. Or if the person feels they're weak, then they're pushed to the side. But the ideal quality for our leaders now, politeness, humility, but strength. Strength in the face of evil. And it is reported, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, reported that there were three people in Quraysh. They were the best of character. When they spoke to you, they will tell you the truth. And when you sp spoke to them, they would not accuse you of lying. They were not suspicious. And they were Kathir al Haya. They had good character and they were very modest. Abu Bakr al Siddiq, Uthman ibn Affan, and Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah radiallahu anhu. So a sidq, truth, not twisting things around. Straightforward, and when you speak to them, they don't suspect you, they don't prejudge you. That's the kind of relationship that we need to, to nurture amongst ourselves. And Abu Ubaidah radiallahu uh, anh, contrary to what many people understand, he was one of the first Muslims. As a matter of fact, he accepted Islam one day after Abu Bakr as siddiq The next day, he was Muslim. That's how far back he goes. And he went through the period of Mecca, suffering and, 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 and striving and going through the changes that the other companions were going through. And all the while, he was patient and he persevered. He persevered through this, this, this difficult time period until the Hijrah came and they went to Medina. But there in the early days of Medina, Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anh, he had a very harrowing incident, a very frightening incident. And that was in the Battle of Badr. And you recall the great Battle of Badr when Abu Sufyan had gathered together the goods of the Muslims, had taken their wealth, confiscated it, took it on a caravan to Syria, the Prophet ﷺ put together 313 Muslims to meet this caravan. Abu Sufyan escaped and they turned around and the strength of Mecca, over a thousand warriors were in front of them. This is the great battle of Badr, Yawm al-Furqan. And it's here that Abu Ubaidah, you remember his quality now. And he was known in Mecca. So when the Muslims faced the disbelievers and they saw Abu Ubaidah, they would want to go to the other side. But it is reported that a man came to Abu Ubaidah, confronted him on every side. When Abu Ubaidah saw this person, he would leave and go to the other point. Then he would come, the man would come to the other side. This is not like Abu Ubaidah, right? That's not his qualities. 
But every time this man would come, Abu Ubaidah would go to another side. Finally, the man blocked the way between him and Quraysh, and Abu Ubaidah struck him with one blow and he died. When they found out later, when they went to Abu Ubaidah to ask him, who was this man? He said, it was my father. It was my father. Now you imagine this situation. If you think about Arab society at that time, which was, a, which was a tribal society. Family was the most important thing. As we say here in the West, blood is thicker than water. Family was the most important thing. They would say, Unsir Akhaka, Zaliman O Madluma, help your brother whether he is oppressor or oppressed. He's your family, so you help him. He broke all ties with family, with tribalism, with nationalism, his complete loyalty was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a crucial uh, concept, this is a crucial quality. Where does our loyalty uh, lie? We're finding in many cases that the tribe and family and nesab genealogy for many people in cultural Islam is more important than their relationship with other believers. The generation we need now, because Allah has blessed us with people of different nationalities, different races, different languages, all together, what we need now is that complete loyalty to Islam to come away from tribalism completely. <coughs> Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an continued in his relationship with the Prophet And it is reported in the Battle of Uhud, it's the following year the Quraysh returned and the Muslims put the Mount Uhud at their backs. But there was a weakness on the side with a small mountain that if they went forward, that mountain had to be protected. And the Prophet ﷺ put archers on the mountain. But when the Muslims were victorious in the beginning and went forward, the archers left their position and they found themselves in a sandwich surrounded by disbelievers. The Prophet ﷺ said, that was the most awkward situation of my life, was there in Uhud. They knocked him into a ditch, smashed his head, smashed his helmet into his face, were trying, coming on all sides. There were 10 people who stood their ground around the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. One of them was a woman, by the way. Nusayba, radiallahu anha, was one of the ten who stood their ground. But Abu Ubaidah distinguished himself as one of the strong ten who stood in front of this evil. After the battle was over and they were uh, dealing with the wounds, they found the Prophet ﷺ, in front of his head was smashed and there were discs of the helmet stuck in his jaw literally smashed into his face. And Abu Bakr went to take it out with his hands. Abu Ubaidah moved him and he put it with his teeth. He pulled out the disc. Every time he pulled the disc, his teeth would fall out. So he was completely selfless. His mahabba, his love of the Prophet ﷺ was not just a word. His love was a reality of his life. That he was prepared to give everything in defense of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet, peace be upon him, would then send him on special missions because he trusted him, he was trustworthy. And the Prophet was recorded to have said, Inna li kulli umma aminan wa inna amin hadhi umma Abu Ubaidah. Every nation has a custodian, a trustworthy person. And this is what we need in our leaders now. Trustworthy people. And he said the custodian of this ummah is Abu Ubaidah. The Prophet ﷺ sent him for another caravan down by the Red Sea. And he gave them only dates. And as they would move along, each soldier would have one date to eat for the whole day. And so you would take that date with water and you would nourish that date. That's your breakfast, lunch and dinner. And when they reached the area down by Jeddah 
and they were holding their position, the dates ran out. And it was, they, were, they were in such an extreme uh, position that they started to eat anything they could find. And they started to eat this khabat, so they called Jaysh al khabat, it's like a thorn bush. And they would take it and boil it in water for soup. Till Allah Azza wa Jal manifested a huge whale came up on the shore by Jiddah. And they ate from the whale for over a month. They never left their position. And so Abu Ubaidah now is an extremely committed person. Now when we think of a committed person today, you think this person is multezim and committed. And that person unfortunately in many cases becomes narrow-minded. They're into their sheikh, they're into their madhab, they're into their movement. But Abu Ubaidah has the balance. And this came out when the Christian Najranis, this is near the end of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Amal Wufud, when the different delegations came, the people came from Najran, who were Christians, and they said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we were Muslims before you. They came to debate. We were Muslim before you. And the Prophet Sallallahu then took them on, and eventually they submitted, not to become Muslim, they never, they didn't accept Islam. But they said, we will accept your rule. We will accept Muslims as our rulers. And so in that case, being dhimmi, they would pay the jizya. And the jizya or the tax for those protected people is actually less than zakat, by the way. Because some books try to say, this is a terrible poll tax, which is put on to other people who are not Muslims. It's less than zakat. But even in the society we're living, we pay income tax. You have in infrastructure to repair the roads, to have your hydro and whatnot. But the shahid here, the witness here is that Najranis came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, send with us a man who is beloved by you and who can help us to sort ourselves out in our economic affairs. We want to pay jizya, but we have some problems in our economic affairs. We, ne we need somebody to really help us work this out. Umar ibn Khattab an, he waited around, you know, hoping that the Prophet would choose him, but the Prophet chose Abu Ubaidah. Now look at this quality now. He is completely committed to Islam, ready to give his life, but at the same time, he's flexible enough to go amongst the Christians who are not Muslims and in their understanding, their economy, bring the justice of Islam to them so they can repair themselves and, and be part of the nation as protected people. This is the quality that we need. Commitment, but yet flexibility to go right downtown uh, to the wharfs, to go anywhere to practice Islam, to speak to people, to talk to people, not to be afraid, not to be ashamed, open-minded, to, to, to meet people where they are, try to understand where they're coming from. These are the dawah techniques that we need to internalize. And this is what Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anh, was famous for and put it in his life. Following this, very interesting thing came about. This is one of the qualities, this is an amazing quality. After the death of the Prophet sallam, the Ansar, the helpers went to the Saqifa, a garden in Medina, and they were about to choose one of their own to be the new leader of Islam. The Muhajireen who came from Mecca informed them that we are the Muhajireen and we have been given this responsibility by the Prophet ﷺ himself. Omar then, according to some reports, Omar stretched his hand to Abu Ubaidah. He said, Abu Ubaidah, you are the custodian of this ummah, and so I give my hand to you to be the new Khalifa of the Muslims. What did Abu Ubaidah say? Okay, what would happen with one of us? Brother, you're now the president, you're the imam, you're the emir, and some of us, if you tell him, you know, he's the emir, then he'll say, Amir al Mu'mineen. Abu Ubaidah said, how can I accept 
the leadership of the Muslims when there is a man amongst us who the Prophet Sallallahu gave the responsibility to lead us in prayer and he held that position he held that position and Abu Ubaidah stretched his hand to Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu and so he was not um, greedy he had no desire for leadership this extremely important quality he saw the leader that the leader should be the most qualified for the position and not the one who got his name up there first or who had the most votes but the one who is the most qualified for the position should be the one who is the leader of the believers this is an extremely important quality because I found in some of the places that I went to I found masjids where the leadership has been there so long it's like you need to have a coup d'etat in order to change the leadership in the mosque that's not the way it's supposed to be the sunnah way the natural way is that young people are with the leaders and they're being trained and when they are ready give them the leadership give them the leadership so Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an distinguished himself in how he was able to uh, defeat his nafs and overcome the desire for power. Following this, when the Muslims were attacked by the Romans in the north, Abu Ubaidah was given the responsibility to lead the Muslims into the land of the Romans. And victory after victory came until Constantinople was on one side, the Euphrates was on the other side. They had opened up Syria, but a terrible plague, a terrible ta'un came and people were dropping down. And so Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, he wrote a letter to Abu Ubaidah and he said, if you receive this letter in the morning, come to Medina in the afternoon. If you receive it in the afternoon, after Fajr, leave. Abu Ubaidah wrote back to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, and he said in words, the translation is, I know that you need me, but I am in an army of Muslims. And I have no desire to save myself from what is afflicting them. I do not want to separate from them until Allah wills. So when this reaches you, release me and allow me to stay. When Umar got this letter, he started to cry. The Sahaba around him said, is Abu Ubaidah dead? Umar said, no, but death is near. Death is near. And sure enough, by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal, the plague struck Abu Ubaidah. And in his last words, he is reported to have said, and this is the translation, and this is his wasiyah, it's like his advice to us. He said, let me give you some advice which will cause you to be on the path of goodness always. Look at this advice. Establish prayer. Fast in Ramadan. Give sadaqah, meaning zakat. Perform hajj and umrah. Remain united. Remain united and support one another. It's very important advice. And then he said, be sincere to your leaders and do not conceal anything from them. Don't let the world destroy you. For even if a man were to live a thousand years, he would still end up with the fate that you see me in. And then he told them, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He said, Mu'adh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, lead the people in salat. And then he passed away. Abu Ubaidah is leaving us critical qualities. Critical qualities. Think about this, study his life, his life. We need to train a generation, raise a generation with this kind of balance. A modest person, shy, polite, but strong. See the quality? He's polite and shy, but strong. Okay, committed to Islam, completely committed, 
but flexible enough to go amongst Christians, non-Muslims, and deal with them in their society. Not in the mosque, to go amongst them in their society and establish the justice of Islam within their lives. Truthful in his speech. And when you speak to him, he doesn't suspect you. No suadhan, no bad thinking about other people. Because prejudgment, this is what is killing us. You meet a brother or a sister, they look at you and they say, um, brother, um, which country are you from? Because they're gonna judge you now, right? And so we would be in Medina, I lived in Medina for many years, I could tell people, because they wear their clothes uh, like a uniform. The hat and the shirt has got to be exactly like it is. The kurta and the hat and the pajamas or the jalabiya, everything has got to be uniform. And suddenly a man comes with a Nigerian hat, a Moroccan top, Pakistani pants, and Sudani shoes. <laughs> and they look at him and they say, that's an American there. That's a Westerner. He's a Westerner. Because he's not tied with any of the cultures, right? But this prejudgment we have, this quality is like innocence, right? It's innocence. If you're doing wrong, they're gonna find out that you're doing wrong. But they don't suspect you. See, their heart is clean. It's a crucial quality now for us. We're rising, the ummah is rising. But it needs to rise in a balanced way, not one extreme or another extreme. Clean relationships. Patience under hardship. Complete loyalty to Islam. Tribe is secondary. It's not the main thing in life. Trustworthiness. Selflessness. No greed for power. No greed for power. True mahabba. True love of the Prophet not just in word, but in deed, and in the very readiness to sacrifice everything. True brotherhood, being a leader, and he wants the same as his followers. Many of our leaders today, they hide in the palace, they hide behind and let the people, you all go forward. That's not Islamic leadership. His final advice, interesting, establish the foundations of Islam. That means that we need to go back and, and really understand our Tawheed properly. Really try to understand and perfect our Salah as much as possible. To fast in Ramadan properly. Ramadan's right around the corner, right? You need to prepare for Ramadan. Not just to buy dates and buy meat, but we need to prepare our understanding of what is about to happen to us in this month. So his advice, establish your foundations, right? Your foundations are strong, the building is strong. Remain united. Remain united. Support one another. That means that sometimes we have to agree to disagree. Some things are different between us. That's still my brother, that's still my sister. Do not conceal anything from leaders. If something is wrong, tell them. Right? It may have to be in a polite way, but tell them. And don't be fooled by this world. It looks beautiful outside. Everybody's happy and riding around in Vancouver. And everybody's feeling good and smiling. It's an illusion. It's an illusion. Because unless we as a nation and, and, and we as a people deal with our pollution and our corruption, this very beautiful environment will turn against us. Well, Iyadu Billah, it's an illusion. So let us not be fooled by what is happening out there. Let us not be fooled. So I leave you with these thoughts and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to have mercy on me and you. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to raise up hundreds and thousands of Abu Ubaidahs and hundreds and thousands of Khadijahs and Aishas in our ranks and give this generation the ability to establish 
the word of Allah in this world and to take the message to every corner of this planet. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.